Welcome to the Cash Flow Guys Podcast. All right, boys and girls, you know what time it is. You should know where you are. This is Tyler Chef, and I am the host of the Cash Flow Guys Podcast. And this week, no Mikey. Mikey is out flying the fe- the, the friendly skies because another pilot probably didn't show up to work, and that's you know how he makes the big bucks. Is when the other pilots can't make it, they get the sniffles or whatever goes on. Mike steps in as the pinch hitter, grabs the controls, and takes that thing up to thirty thousand feet. Which helps pay our advertising budget, by the way. So thank you, Mike, for your donation of time and cash. But with me today, I've got a guest, and it's been a long time since we've had a guest on the show. So I personally am pretty excited about it because, you know, I love talking to Mike, but it's just a little different having somebody new to talk to. And bonus, I get to walk away with learning something new. So anytime I can take away something myself, learn something new, I know you guys are going to learn something because this is going to be a great episode. With me today, we've got Dr. Stephen Nguyen. I got that right, didn't I? Yes, you did. All Perfect. right. Hey, how are you doing? Good, good. Hey, very excited to, to come on and to right. share my journey. So it looks like you graduated pharmacy school in 2013. Now you're working as a hospital pharmacy director. But while working full time, you wanted more. And I dig that. I enjoy that. Uh, so you've scaled to 90 units with, <laughs> there's my best part. I'm going to say this one slow, guys, so you all get it. He scaled to 90 units without any partners in five years with off-market deals. That doctor is a home run. I love that. Uh, I'll show you, tell you a short story about that. I won't get done with this intro. Steven acquired two apartment complexes and one mobile home park by using direct mail and now provides direct mail consultation service along with mentorship. Welcome to the show. Once again, very, very excited, Tyler. And thanks for having me on. My funny little story is I was over at, and Rod Cleef is a a guy that is a friend of mine, fellow podcaster. yeah. Yeah. I was at one of his trainings, which by the way, guys are very good. If you want to go really get some top notch education in multifamily, Rod is one place I would look in put in, you know, go to several, but Rod's is real good. Anyway, I, I was at his event one day. He called me and invited me as a guest. It was in Tampa. And I, I, you know, you meet and greet people, you shake hands. And this one guy walks up to me and he's all nervous. And he says, Hey, how many doors do you have? I was like, what? I mean, it wasn't like, hi, how you doing? Nothing like that. How many doors do you have? I'm like, well, what does that matter? He says, I have 50 and I don't talk to anybody that has less than me. And I just kind of looked at him. I was like, what? <laughs> so I was like, well, I, go ahead and try to find some a bigger dog. Then I'm not even going to get into the conversation with you. Wow. <laughs> By the way, that was not an, an endorsed Rod introduction. Rod would teach you a better way to introduce yourself in, a, in an environment like that. Oh, I just I got a kick out of that, though. It made me chuckle. I'm impressed. So I'm, let's start, if you don't mind, talking about the no partners thing. Where does that come from? Is it just, hey, why? If I don't, I don't need them, I got this, or you built a team, or what does that look like? What made you decide the no partner route? Yeah, you know, a lot of real estate investors, as you alluded to, they typically, you know, partner and syndicate. Um, starting off. And I feel like there's a big misconception and I'm I'm sure you've come across it too, where a lot of people syndicate or partner because they don't have money. Right. And they think that that's the only way for them to get into multifamily real estate. Right. You know, they've heard it from everywhere. A lot of beginners reach out to me and say, Hey, I own, I have zero units, don't have zero experience, but I want to syndicate. And my first question is always why? So, you know, for me, as my background as a pharmacy director, we're naturally very skeptical. Right. Uh, a lot of people do not know it's about, you know, eight years of schooling. Come, you come out with a doctorate degree and we're the nature of us is being very skeptical and that's what we have to be. And, you know, even I was skeptical, like, why would anyone trust me with their money? Why would anyone want to partner with me? And why would I want to go to my friends and family? Well, I don't know if I'm good enough yet. Yeah. But that's what made me go down my own route about partnering. And, you know, it just was very nice to not have to run things by people. You just, I just can do everything myself, right? right? Versus when you have a partner, everything decision you make, you have to run it through your partner. And, you know, for me, I work in the hospital and, you know, you do assisted living. So, you know, we see kind of the, the worst things that happen yeah. and it's the four D's, right? Disagreement, right. death, disability, um, divorce. Right. And that can be out of your control and that can completely force you to sell a deal. And I'm, purely buy and hold for the most part. I don't want to sell. If I do sell, it would be a trade up. So for me, I just got into real estate more for the control and the freedom. And I felt like I didn't want to give up any of that at this point um, while I'm working a full-time W-2. So that's why right now I do not partner, Um, but maybe down the road, I'll reevaluate and see about something that's what I want to do. I think that's smart. And I, I started my journey just like you did. I had income. I had a great job, made great money. 
for a lot of the same reasons. That said, I am a spoiled only child, and I didn't want to share either. So, so <laughs> but it's like, well, if I don't have to do, if I don't have to take on partners or investors, then so be it. My first five years in real estate, I had zero partners. Yeah. I used the bank, and it worked just fine. And I got to a point to where I gravitated into single partner, bring on one partner, because I did have control, more control than I would, you know, and obviously in a syndicate. And to be honest with you, those of you that jump right into syndication, I think you're missing a big element because you get so set back from the transactional business. Because you, when you get a syndicate, when you build a syndicate, because that's what I'm doing, and I'm mm -hmm. learning that I need a much bigger team, number one. Now I have a whole army of attorneys and I have extra tax people and I have all these extra moving parts, that's not a complaint by any means, but it's definitely a lot more to manage. And I personally like being out in this, on the street, talking to the sellers, negotiating the deals. And that's why Mike is such a huge asset to me because he does a lot of that back office. I mean, I Mike's, know. Mike's whole job is managing the fund. I'm not going to call it drama, but the structure of the fund. I mean, that's, I mean, he flies planes for a living, but really he spends a lot more hours on the fund than he does on Flying. He's probably 60 hours a week just on the legalities and all the extra level and all the extra layers, things I'm sure you probably see in working in a hospital and being a, uh, in the medical industry. And it can really bog you down. And I, be honest with you, I miss being uh, just me and, and another partner. And my wife and I have been partners for years, obviously, in the business. But so, yeah, I think that's smart the way you're doing it. And if you, you know, you can always pivot. The only reason we went into syndication, frankly, is we wanted to do bigger deals that were outside of what I could swing my on myself. Now I'm getting into the, you know, uh, the, two to $10 million deals. And that's a little more than Tyler can swing on himself. So I had to start yeah. looking at syndication, but yeah, if I could roll back the test of time, I probably would have done more of the deals that I passed up on in the past, uh, learned that lesson the hard way. And then, uh, yeah, I would have, would have grown up bigger. So that's good stuff. Now you 90 units. That's, that's fast. Five years. That's good. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you, did, how do you feel about the pace? Was it a comfortable pace for you? Because working a, a nine to five, especially in what you do for a living, that's yeah. a very hands-on, there's a lot of complexities in what you do for a living. It's a, There's a huge, massive amount of responsibility. How did you balance the time between the two? Yeah, that, that, that's really great. Um, great question. For me, you know, it was a very natural, I guess, progression is what I'd call it in terms of scaling. Right. I did have a lot of massive growth in 2021 during COVID, ironically. But, you know, initially I just started off in single family homes. Right. Uh, I house hacked actually. So I just lived in the master bedroom. I'd rent out the other rooms and the income would just cover my mortgage for the most part. So it just helped reduce my living expense. And, right. you know, since the primary residence, you can do 10% down. Right. So I did that for three years in California. And as you know, you know, single family homes in California are a million dollars. So, you know, I knew this was not scalable. So I just said, well, I'm self-managing all these properties in California. They're more expensive. So I, I need to pivot. And I pivoted to Oklahoma City where I could get about 20 to 26 units for about half a million dollars off market. And to me, that just blew my mind because that's cheaper than a condo yeah, in California, exactly. right? <laughs> and that's crazy. you can get a lot more cash flow and I can afford a property manager. Yeah. So that's how you scale, right? Yep. So a lot of the deals that I get are all off market through direct mail and I negotiate directly with the owner, no broker involved. Right. Um, so it's direct to owner. And what's nice about that is you can build the trust you can understand the pain points and then you're more likely to get seller financing or have the opportunity to pitch it. And that's how you get in with lower, no money down. And then you can afford you know, the contractor, the property manager, and then they can re help you renovate the units. So a lot of what I'm doing is I'm renovating all, a lot of my units. Like I think both my, my 20 unit and my 26 unit, I'm renovating half the units concurrently. With my mobile home park, I'm renovating that and oh, wow. I'm working at full time W2. So it's all just leverage and identifying a team. So once you have that team, it doesn't require that much of your time. And I'm a little bit unique in the sense of I really empower my property manager and general contractor to pick what's best for the unit because they know the market the best as the boots on the ground. So, and that kind of throws them off because most owners will just tell them exactly what to do and they have to follow exactly. But for me, I always just kind of say, what can we do to renovate this unit to look modern while being cost effective, right. while being renter proof? That's and smart. that always turns out to be the same thing. LVP flooring, you know, some light gray wall paint, bathtub kits, 
you know, maybe refinish the kitchen cabinets or if you need to replace it, shake your cabinets. So it's pretty cookie cutter and then you just copy and paste it. Right. So once you kind of get past that initial learning curve and then you follow a system and you leverage your team, honestly, it doesn't take me that much more time at this point. I just have a once weekly call. Boy, that was that was a, that was a huge, there's so much in there. I want to unpack. That was a lot of nuggets. That was awesome. And I'm going to start with my favorite one. You said a very important thing. And then guys hit rewind when you're direct to seller, it's easier to get seller financing. Let that, let that simmer boys and girls at home, because that is absolutely true. And you're talking to a guy that has a real estate license. I have a real estate license and you're right, because I think I am probably the only realtor in America that asks every seller if they'll accept payments for their equity or take consider terms. So tell me about your experiences with dealing. I love the direct to, to seller idea and that I'm, a, and yes, I, maybe I'm a hypocrite being a realtor saying that, but it's true. Realtors are automatically they're, they're number one realtors are not trained in negotiation at all it is not in the license program anywhere in the country and i've examined several different states i've talked to realtors all over the country over the last seven years doing this podcast and it, this doesn't exist so having a realtor negotiate for you automatically i think starts you out at a disadvantage i love what you say about getting number one you're hitting them direct mail so when you're dealing direct to seller first of all there's no real estate commission baked in there no. Now you talk about a half million dollar deal. That's six, seven, whatever it may be, percent um, coming right off the top. So the deal it it makes better sense in a lot of cases for the seller. You know, sometimes sellers wind up giving up their equity, and that's true. But on the buy side, it's a home run. You're already <laughs> starting out six percent ahead because guys at home, that real estate commission. The only person that buys that pays a real estate commission, by the way, guys, is the buyer. Hundred percent. They say, well, the seller pays it. No, it comes out of the seller's proceeds. But don't kid yourself to think that the seller can't do simple math. If the real estate commission is 20 grand, they're going to add 20 grand to the asking price, or in some cases, they're going to add 40 grand to the selling price. And then they're going to say, okay, that's how much I get because sellers are focused on net, right? That's why they have this yeah. thing called a seller net sheet. So I love that you're direct to the seller. You're using direct mail. And I want to, I'm going to, we're going to cover that in a minute because I don't want to get lost in, in where we're at. Second thing you said is contractor picks what's best. And boy, I'm telling you, I'm doing that right now. And I did it initially, but I didn't paint lines on the road. What I did was I didn't, my mistake with that is I didn't initially, this is going back many years ago when I used to flip houses. I didn't set up a, I didn't have find the right contractors to do this with. And I like how you said that because you're absolutely right. If you find the right contractors, that understand what you're trying to accomplish and know what the end result looks like. If you can get your vision out of your head and into theirs and they realize they're going to get a lot more work for you, for you. If, if you're in Oklahoma or Alabama or wherever you may be, and they're going to get repeat business out of you, they want it easy too, guys, folks at home understand that the contractor does not want to fight with Steven. They don't want to have to try to trick him into getting more money. They don't, a, a reputable contractor does not like change orders because it's a stress point. It's some, it's just uncomfortable. Now there are the folks out there that are the opposite, but you sat down with these contractors. You guys have a meeting of the minds. I'm sure you probably didn't jump in the sack with the first one you met. You, this probably took a couple people and to get, get the skill going, right? To understand number one, to get clear in communication with them. That's tough because there's different personalities. You're a highly educated individual and there are contractors out there that are the extreme opposite. So now that you've gone through, that process. I, I love how you said it. It can really be cookie cutter. Here's 26 units. We're renovating half of them. The other half, I assume, are, are leased up. And when the leases expire, just go do what you did here on the left side of the building over on the right, something like that. Hit the nail head. <laughs> so you get to then know what you can very accurately, and I love this, you can very accurately forecast what your CapEx and your rehab costs are going to be because you're not making wild changes. Correct. So if everything is, for example, when we do our renovations, my wife is stuck on bare paints. She won't buy any paint but bare. So the contractors know they got to buy bare paint and it has to be, um, what's the color she uses? It's this off-white color that she wants on every property on the inside. And there's a color scheme for the outside and, and she does these across the board. So what does that mean? That means we can, we can uh, use economies of scale. Talking about COVID, and I'm sure you probably ran into this too, During, after, post COVID, we're now in a very uh, inflationary environment. I don't know if y'all have shopped for a five gallon bucket of paint recently at Home Depot, but things have changed. <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> Fortunately, we had had, we got about 25 gallons of our it's Adobe White from Bear that we have been hanging on to because as we bring a new unit online or we renovate one or lease, or lease up or a change out or something like that, now we already have our, our material so we could fix our costs. So for you, Stephen, that means much better bottom line because you can really 
accurately look into the future, can't you? Yes. I love that. Most folks aren't doing that. Most folks are in a panic over this whole recession thing, but it sounds like you're not really even overly concerned about it because you got control of what's going on. Yeah, I actually scaled the most during COVID when interest rates were low and it was a hot market. And I got my both my apartment complexes and my mobile home park in 2021 wow. in one year. So a lot of this growth was was really rapid. And kind of back to your original question, what allowed me to do it was just leveraging a team. Right. And for me, you know, like a lot of people go into real estate because they hate their W-2, but you can learn a lot of nuggets from your W-2 and it translates very well into real estate. Like for me, I manage 40 pharmacists. Yeah. What am I developing? Soft skills. I know how to ask questions. I know how to ask questions to get things done. And by me asking questions, it helps me learn too. So a lot of times when I interview multiple property managers, multiple contractors, I'm asking a lot of questions. And after you interview 20 of them, you start to learn. Right. Every time you talk to a property manager or contractor, you will learn one or two things. And once you kind of know how they think, because general contractors think a little differently compared to a pharmacist, right. that's when you can learn the most and then you know communicate clearly to be on the same page. And, you know, for me, I make it very known that, hey, if you have any question, just respond to me or text me, call me and I'll respond immediately. And I typically do, you That's know, within awesome. a couple hours to help them do their job. So it, it's really, you know, it's a people business, unfortunately. So you have to do your best to vet your team. But then also, you know, I, I'm big on trust, but verify. Oh, okay. so yeah, well said. Yeah, it's a big one. That's a big <laughs> one. I'm remote. I'm remote, right? I'm in California. Yep. I'm working a full-time W-2. It's easy to cheat someone like me, yeah, but that's why I try to build systems in place to say, Hey, like after you finish renovations, can you snap some photos for me? Or maybe I'll send my property manager to come and audit it every month or every week on Friday. So that we'll pay you after the audit's done. We'll pay you your weekly uh, draw. Right. So there's many ways you can manage this um, remotely and build a system. To a contractor that's got a brain, dealing with somebody like you is the kind of customer you want because not because you could be taken advantage of easily because you're going to pay on time every time. There's a mutual accountability, right? You're going to keep them accountable. They need to send documentation, which helps the contractor stay on top of the subs. Uh, I love that. My contractor, like we're working on a project right now in, in near Tampa, and it's healthy. It's a big re. It's a six figure rehab, uh, well into the six figure rehab. And I, the GC I have in that job is amazing. He's the guy that I don't have to. He's beating up everybody and make and maintaining. I say that tongue in cheek, but he is the guy, one of those contractors that has the respect of the construction community. <laughs> Nobody wants to disappoint him because he's been doing it ethically for thirty five years. Wow. He's kind of like the OG of contractors in the Tampa market. So everybody is like, they want to do their best work for him because they so want to be aligned with his company as a subcontractor. He pays well. Is he the cheapest guy in town? Absolutely not. But I don't worry about anything. When I go there, I'm always pleasantly surprised. You know, he, he gives me a quote and it always comes in significantly less. But then again, I have the reputation like you that I, you know, so let's show the, the progress and I pay instantly. We don't, fiddle part around on, on pay. Cause I think that's a big mistake that people make. Uh, I like your attitude that you're, they're not necessarily working for you. It sounds like they're working with you that you've yes. essentially looked at them as partners, as colleagues, and you guys are on the same path, the same trajectory to accomplish very similar goals. Hey, I want to get my stuff rehabbed. I don't want to spend a lot of time shopping for contractors. I want a, a contractor I can trust who will then hire people because you are a contractor of pharmacy, essentially, a general mm -hmm. contractor of pharmacy. It's the same job, just different tools. You're dealing with people and, and prescriptions. He's dealing with people and lumber. Yes. And so I think that probably helps you better understand what how to work with them because, like you said, your job is such that it, it leads that in place. What do you say to the person? Because I know a friend of mine who actually works in the pharmacy space, and she's the girl that writes the software for hospital pharmacies. She's the head oh. of software. So she's a computer person and she writes code that create, that does all your, your tracking of your medications and all that in Florida. Now there's a big hospital group in Florida that she works exclusively for them. She has a lot of the same skills that you do. She directs the technology arm of pharmacy where you're probably the bigger, the, the overarching, the, the umbrella, mm -hmm. you're directing the whole piece. So a girl like her would work for somebody like you, I would imagine. What do you say to the person that doesn't have those skills? Because 
I don't like to use the the term unfair advantage, but it is. And I love it. It's great. (laughs) But that's a big piece of your success, not to take away from your skill sets as a human being. That's that's part of it. But that is that because your job is ideal for this. I mean, it's like you're going to crush it in real estate with the skill sets you have, no doubt. Uh, What do you say to somebody that doesn't have those skills that is in the same it is in a similar income level that you are? Let's say a a physician makes Mm -hmm. A decent, you know, a good income, but they're not necessarily don't have the same skills that you do because they don't really manage people. They more manage someone's care. You know, it's a whole different animal. What do you say to them as far as getting started? How do they how do they, how do they do that? I don't want to answer the question for you because I have my own ideas. But you- yeah, I mean, like I said, with every skills, people start off a beginner, myself included. I, I never, you know, I developed it. Over my 10 year pharmacy career and right. the past five years I spent as a pharmacy director, you know, as you hit the nail on the head, it is slightly unfair advantage because pharmacists were detail oriented and system oriented by nature. Right. And the ones who are the best at that rise up to become director. So, you know, I was very fortunate um, to be that way. But the way I kind of phrase it is, you know, obviously you have to learn how to do it and de- develop it today. You can shortcut your experience by learning from somebody, whoever that is. There's a lot of resources nowadays. You can learn on YouTube. There's podcasts like your podcast, multiple other podcasts. You can follow a course. You can follow a mentor. And then that can shortcut your path to success. Like in in medicine and pharmacy, we do something called layered learning. And all it is is when I'm a first year in pharmacy school, I'm learning from a second year. When you're a second year, you're learning from a third year. When you're a third year, you're learning from a fourth year. When you're a fourth year, you're learning from an actual pharmacist. So it's just layered learning. And you're just following the person in front of you and you're just following their path. So that's one method to do that. But another method, which I personally do, is I think very systematically and I don't blame the individual. I look at the system first and see what I can do to improve that system. And I see what we can do collaboratively together um, to solve the problem. So it's always a a collaboration and teamwork mindset, even though I'm paying everybody, I know that I can, you know, be a little bit harsher, but to me, I said, this is a long-term relationship. Obviously, if you find one or good, one or two good property managers, general contractors, and you treat them well, guess what's going to happen when they find you an off-market deal somewhere else? Who do you think they're going to bring the deal to? Right. They're going to bring it to me because they like working with me Absolutely. and they like the way I do things. And it's a very smooth process. So, you know, being very easy to work with is also a skill. So it's just really surrounding yourself with the right people and trying to adopt how they think. And then once you kind of emulate their system, you can add your own flavor to it. So that's what I've been a big believer of. Like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? There's nothing. Amen. <laughs> there's nothing that is hasn't been done in real estate. So just find someone who's doing what you want to do and follow them, understand their mindset and emulate them and then slowly add your own tweak to it. So, you know, even though I scaled to 90 units, I'm still humble enough to like still learn from other people. If I could learn something new and tweak my system and do better for the next time, I'm always all ears. So it's just always being a lifelong student. And that's what I am as a pharmacist. So it's just always asking the right questions and then learning. That's very, very true. And those are great points. I love the layered learning, the way you explain the layered learning. You're always learning from somebody that's just a step above you, ahead of you, rather, I should say. That's yeah. that's a great thing. I, I think part of the problem with real estate education, coaching and whatnot, is that the person that's teaching the class is usually so far ahead of the people learning that there's a lot lost in translation. Well, of course he'd know that. Well, no, he wouldn't because... Yeah, you learned that on, on year one, but this person has doesn't even know that they're supposed to have learned that. I found that a lot working with students. I don't do coaching anymore, but I used to. Uh, and I know that now you have a coaching program, which I, I love that. Um, you actually got a consult offer consultation and coaching or and a course. Um, <laughs> I was on your link tree today and I love the topics. I mean, it's, and guys, I'll put this his link to his link tree in this in the uh, show notes. So you can click on it and it'll take you to YouTube and TikTok and all that good stuff. You get into the multifamily piece, you you break it down. And I, I can tell that you're a systems guy because I can tell the way you've laid out the course. And I love that. And guys, here's the thing. People say, I don't need an education. I can learn off of YouTube. Well, the problem with learning off of YouTube is it's not organized, which Correct. means you get the four, the four-year pharmacist 
description when you're a year one. Well, at year one, you're not ready to really hear the four-year pharmacist. That's not layered learning. That's basically coagulated learning, I guess you could call it, or I don't know what you call it, but it's not. <laughs> that's the problem with, with learning when you're going down the free route. And I know a lot of people listen to the show are like, I want it for free. Like, I put out a, a video on subject two. They're like, where do I get your form? From the attorney that I paid to hire it, to write it. That's where you get it. Well, can I have it for free? I don't think you're ready to use my form because you don't understand it. It's written in Florida right. law, not California. So no, I don't give those out. You can buy it from my lawyer for like 150 bucks. I mean, it's, it's pretty cheap. So I love how you broke this down. And guys, the very top link on his uh, link tree covers this course. And, and literally you hit start, you remit payment and off you go to the races. I love this. It's priced well. It's well within reach. And if you're in, if you're maybe you're a pharmacist and I have a lot of medical professionals of all levels, I've got everything from nurses to neurological surgeons that listen to this show. I've talked to them. They've done business with us before. So I'd love to hear some of you in the medical industry. I think people that are pilots, I know I got a lot of airline pilots. You guys are checklist people just like you, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> this is the type of training that this is the way it should be laid out. Full disclosure, I have not seen the inside of the course, but I like the way it's laid out and, and going through your social media and whatnot. I can see that you're a guy that's really focused on the details and getting to the, the meat of it, handing things out. So get over there and take a look at that, guys. I want to go down, though, and I want to I want to pivot to talk about marketing because getting the deals done and getting the unit count is one thing, and that's part of, that's maybe towards the end of the journey. But the front end of the journey is you got to have people to talk to. And for most real estate investors, that's one of that. Well, for all real estate investors, that's a challenge. I am a marketer by trade. That's what I do. And it is a challenge for me even to get qualified seller leads. Um, lots of different systems out there. I see that you use PropStream. You're a, a uh, affiliate for PropStream as well. And that's a great software. I use it still every day. I used to use it this morning, actually. I was doing some research on another assisted living property we're thinking about buying in the Tampa area, and I was using it to deep dive. So talk to me about Yellow Letters Complete. You Yellow letters, guys, in case of, for those of you that are new investors, is a method. It's a direct mail marketing mm -hmm. method. And the whole, the, the shtick is that people are more likely to open something that's come, that comes from someone they know. If you get a, something with a barcode and your name's printed on it in, in a nice text or, you know, a nice font and a, and a very professional or official thing, people are less likely to open it because it looks salesy. But when they get a, an invitation style envelope in the mail and they open it up and it's got a yellow, yellow letter in it, yellow, yellow legal pad. Um, it's people are more inclined to read it and there's good ones. There's, and there's definitely some bad ones out there, but direct mail, Steven is something that a lot of folks have a negative, uh, feeling about. And it's, a lot of that's because they don't get any results. So what do you say to the person that has done it? They spent a couple thousand dollars on direct mail and they're still sitting there with their hands in their pockets. Yeah. Well, let me show you my experience of my own direct mailing service. So I basically spent three thousand dollars to send 1800 letters 300 letters a month for six months and i closed on two apartment complexes all off market and i had three hundred thousand dollars of equity day one so i spent three thousand dollars and made three hundred thousand dollars of equity day one wow. that's a hundred x return on my investment i think no one would say no to that <laughs> no. that might even be crypto <laughs> for those crypto people out there especially this week um it's just not this week. Yes. And <laughs> to me, that's just day one equity. So you're buying these deals, right? My 26 unit I got for half a million dollars. I got $70,000 in sell repair credit, which cut my down payment in half. And it's going to probably, I can double the rents after my renovation plan from 350 to 700. And as you know, as you increase your rents, you increase your net operating income, which increases the value. It's Absolutely. called forced appreciation and it's going to be worth $1.5 million. So let's just take a step back here and do the math. I got it for half a million dollars. Let's say I put in $200,000 to renovate most of the 26 units. I'm all in for $700,000. It's worth 1.5 after you do a cash out refi, 75% loan to value. You just pull back all your down payment, all your renovation costs, and probably a little cherry on top on top of that. And then you can go buy another piece of real estate. And that's how you scale about partners, right? Oh, like very boy. natural progression. And for me, it was just all thanks to going direct to owner with my direct mail. And you kind of hit the nail on the head. You want owners to open your letters. How do you do that? So I'll tell you my personal strategy that I use and that I do for my clients and my students. Um, I'm fully transparent and give out information. So use an A2 size envelope. 
That's the thank you card sized envelope, not your traditional eight and a half by 11. Okay. Why is that? It feels like it's coming from a friend or family member. So you're more likely to open it. You want to handwrite their name and address on the front of the envelope. So you can pay a company like Yellow Letters Complete to do something like that. And then you want a live stamp. Once again, feels more personalized. And then they're going to turn the envelope over and you're going to have your information on the back side, not the front side, the back side to create that wow. mystique and intrigue. From there, you I actually don't tuck the flap of the envelope into. I just tuck the flap of the envelope in. I don't actually lick and seal it. And another reason is someone is wondering, wait, who opened my letter? What's going on here? Oh, 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 oh that's brilliant. I love that. Right. Because people, I, it happened to me one time where I opened a letter and it, 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 the flap was tucked in. I was like, wait, who opened it? So now you're more inclined to open it. And then from there, they're going to open your letter. And you know, typically it's this generic template that I use. You hit the nail on the head. You want to come off as an average Joe, an average person. Right. You don't want to come off as a big syndicator, a big fancy corporation, because a lot of these letters are going towards mom and pop. Exactly. You know, in, in a smaller town and mom and pop don't want you to sound fancy and you don't want to come off a big, like a big corporation because they'll want to charge you more too. Right. Versus coming off as an average regular person. And then from there, I have a handwritten call to action on the letter itself. And it might just be like, for example, Hey, Tyler, call me Steven. And this is my number. It's handwritten because it, once again, you want to have a handwritten call to action. And then my name is actually signed. So I actually leverage my doctor title. If you're a doctor, you want to put your title, Dr. Stephen Nguyen. If you're a nurse, put your title. If you're a pilot, veteran, if you have a distinguished title, leverage that title in the letter because it helps build trust. Right. And at the end of the day, the point of the letters is to get people to call you. That's it. Bingo. The point of the letter is to be opened and you want them to call you. And the reality is your response rate is typically one to 3%. Right. This is based off what of my experience. If it's a hot market, like California, Texas, Florida, 1%. So if I send out 300 letters, maybe three responses. If it's in Oklahoma where I invest, it's about 3%, which is nine to 10 letters that call you. So anytime someone calls you, I say, treat these leads like gold because you spent a lot of money to get these leads calling you. And the sad reality is, even out of the nine or 10 that call me, maybe one or two are actually motivated sellers. The rest I call fishers. They just want to fish for a sky high price and they're unrealistic. But for me, I'm always like, I'll play the game. I know if they're asking for a lot of money, I know out the gate, the only way I'll take this deal is credit financing. Your price, my terms. If I'm overpaying by a million dollars on a property, right. I don't mind doing it, but you better give me my terms. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What are my terms? Probably 0% down, 0% interest, because I'm upfronting the interest yes. in the sales price. That's right. I'm overpaying for it. And I'm probably going to build a clause into you know the seller financing. If there's like a five-year balloon and it doesn't appraise, I want to extend that seller finance for another five years. And that's to protect me in case I overpay for the property. So there's always things that it's always a give and take, right? I'll give you this, but you're going to give me this. Right. And it feels fair. Like I think human nature... They want to be reciprocal. So if you give me something, I want to give you something back. So if you can kind of leverage that human psychology, that is is, is how you negotiate credit financing and talk direct to owner. So sorry, I kind of went a little tangent there. No, I, I'm glad you did because I, there was a lot of good information in there. And one of the things that I take away from that is, you know, with this piece, and I love how you're creative, you do things a little differently than I've seen most people do with, with uh, yellow letters. But you, you're, you're laser focused on the mission, the goal. The mission, ladies and gentlemen, folks at home, is to get them to open the envelope and then call you, yeah. period. It's not to entertain or impress. It's to get them to do one function. That's pick up the phone and call me. So things like fancy logos and all this other stuff, if it doesn't directly lend itself to make them pick up the phone, then it doesn't belong in the letter. I love how you said call me Dr. Steven. Well, why the hell is Dr. Steven sending me a letter? I better call him. I don't even know a Dr. Steven, but maybe one of my relatives does, and maybe I should call him for that. Or 
maybe this guy bumped his head and he's going to give me $5 million for my $50,000 house. Who knows? But the bottom line is they're going to pick up the phone. Now, I wish we were on YouTube, Stephen, because I'm going to show you this, but the folks at home can't see it. This is your <laughs> this is your bank letter or your bank envelope. This is one of those leather, faux leather pouches. You can see who sent it to me. Well, it's probably backwards, but I got this in the mail about two years ago. First, I want to talk about the fact that I'm still hanging on to it. Right now, it has uh, turkey sticks in there, but <laughs> my snack. But uh, I won't get rid of this because I think this is one of the most brilliant pieces of marketing on the planet. I got this in the mail one day. On the front, it says People's Community National Bank. It is a zippered top envelope, one like you would take large cash deposits in to the bank or checks or whatever. So I've kept it. If you can accomplish that with your direct mail, then you've got a home run. Because now, every time I open this, I also see that it was sent to me by Russell Brunson, who is the owner of ClickFunnels, who's a master marketer, right? And I hang on to it for that reason. One of these days, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to duplicate that process and send it to my investors, maybe better by potential ones. But you're right. If you can get predictable on you, you have a very focused intent, you want to get them to make the phone call, period. You don't have to put a mat, write a master's thesis and stuff it in the envelope. It's very simple, yellow letter, handwritten. Oh, but Tyler, how am I going to handwrite 30,000? You don't handwrite 30,000. Stephen, how many do you send out a month? You gave the number 300. 300. Right. You already, if you guys would put down Instagram for a minute, you probably type 400 letters worth of Instagram on Instagram every day with your hashtags. So 300 is not going to kill you. So the next piece is, well, how do I organize all this? And, you know, I got to get this. You have a service for that you've put together. So tell me about Yellow Letters Complete. Yeah. So, um, you know, for me, I kind of am a little bit unique where I offer a course slash mentorship. And also I'll do your direct mail automation for you. So for me in the course, I actually teach you how to do the letters yourself. So that's totally fine. I, I'm completely transparent. It's prop stream and I use Yellow Letters Complete and they'll prepare my letters. It's about $1.50 per letter. But the issue that I'm running into with most of the students is that even despite that, even despite an A to Z and how to do your letters, right. they still feel intimidated by it or they do not commit to it for six to 12 months because you have to do it for six to 12 months to have the best results because it compounds. The first two months you send letters out, you will get zero responses and that's normal. But you have to continue doing it for six to 12 months because people will throw your letter into a cupboard somewhere. And all of a sudden, when they're doing spring cleaning or winter cleaning, they're going to see your letter and then maybe reach out to you. Right. In, in real estate, you're you're buying, you're not buying real estate, you're buying situations. Oh, and the situation point. changes month to month. So that's why it's a little bit unique where because what helped me become successful is doing direct mail. I'm very disciplined. Right. I'm a very disciplined person, right. very detail oriented. I don't have as many other obligations pulling me at this time, but I do understand a lot of people, right? You're busy. You're a busy physician. You're a busy airline pilot. And even though it's easy to do the direct mail, people just cannot do that one simple boring work that will help drive your business. So that's why I just offer a service where I'll do it for you because I want to increase your success. If it increases your success, what's going to happen? You're going to refer people over to the program or to the service. So that's why I invest a lot of time and resources to increase your rate of success. And my focus is to just coach you on the um, negotiation side, because that's the hard part where you cannot teach in a course. It's really done through repetition. Right. And in order for me to teach you, you have to talk with live sellers. And then when they talk, when the sellers call them, and then at that point, they go to the coaching sessions and then we talk about strategy and I try to teach them how I would handle this situation. And we're both learning, right? Like I'm still learning as I'm coaching and then they're learning as I teach them my approach on how I do things. There's a lot of people, and especially this is kind of engineers where they kind of get a bad rap for this is, oh, I don't want to pay someone for this. I like to do it myself. <laughs> But what they realize is that they actually lack the soft skills. Engineers, unfortunately, they lack the soft skills. That's not their strong point. No. Their strong point is not soft skills. And they just come off very awkward and they come out the gate with seller financing. And then what's, what's the owner going to say when they don't understand something? No. Exactly. They're going to say no. That's yep. human nature is to say no. Right. So for me, I know that I leverage that no. And I get them to say no to me up front to lower their guard. 
Very nice. This is from Chris Voss, right? It's a calibrated no. I was gonna. I was wondering where that came from. So, <laughs> it, other people have used it. It used to be called back in the old days. It was called the pendulum technique. If you swing them to a no right out of the gate, the only natural place they're going to swing back to is a yes, because you know the, the the law of gravity. If it goes up to no, being on the left, and it swings back, where is it going to hit to a yes? Get the uncomfortableness out of the way. Off you go to the closing table. I love that. So we talk about budget. So we we sign up for the service. You talk about um, on average about let's say we do three hundred a month consistently and i'm not and people say well that's 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 not too bad right 350 or three 300 a month a buck 50 a piece or about 450 a month for a budget guys don't put 450 as your budget because one of the things you said which is very important you said seven to 12 months or six to 12 months rather i say 12 because there are the people that will go well it's been the sixth month and my phone hasn't rang enough yet Right, but the, the rule of sevens, and there's all kinds of an, uh, different analogies and, and terms for this, but you've got to repetitively hit people over and over and over again to prove that you're legitimate, number one, and that you're intent and serious. You're right, Stephen, this stuff will wind up in the circular file, in the credenza, who knows where it winds up. I have people tell me they found it in their glove box you know, a year <laughs> later. Um, so you have to be deliberate. So what does that mean to me? That means, guys, can you write your check, yourself a check for $5,400? If the answer is no, then please don't invest in real estate until you can, number one, because if you don't have $5,400 to invest in your marketing, you don't have any money to invest in an asset. And you, you can't do this and be broke at the same time. you got to get your money right first. Uh, it just doesn't work out that way, being broke and trying to pull this off. So I got my five, six grand set aside as a budget. I pull the trigger with you. We jump into this. Do you have like, is it like a, do you charge monthly for this yellow letters complete or do you use like a one-time thing for like a year? How's that work out? Yeah. So it's a one-time uh, fee up front. Okay. So whether you do just the course or you want me to do mailers for six months or mailers for 12 months, it's just a flat fee up front. Okay. So like you said, you don't have to worry about it. My goal is you basically pay for it. You're going to go through all the educational modules. Right. We're going to pick your market that you uh, want wherever that is. And we're going to find a big range. I'm going to generate your list on prop stream using my criteria. Right. And what one thing I do, which most people don't do is I actually will grab a listing off LoopNet and put it into prop stream to see how they classify apartment complexes. Cause it varies per County. Yes, it does. So I want to make your <laughs> list as accurate as possible. And then from there, my intent is I'll automate your mails for you. So I actually play a calendar on the second Monday of every month. This is how system oriented I am wow. on your calendar. Second Monday of every month, your letters will go out. And on the second Friday of every month, that's when you should expect to hear phone calls. And why do I do Monday is because it takes maybe two or three days to get to you. And people do not open or check their mail seriously until the end of the week when they're winding down. So Monday is very strategic. I didn't just pick Monday out of convenience. It's actually very strategic. And from there, my expectation is you need to respond to your hot leads within 24 hours, whether it's a call, text, or email, just acknowledge it and set up a time to talk one-on-one. -on -one. And then from there, actually in my course, I have a list of 10 questions to ask to help build trust of owners. A lot of people, for me, I'm very natural at it, but I realize people are not. Right. So I created a list of questions. You know, the first initial questions are to build trust. And what I tell my students is honestly, the intent of the first call it's just to build trust and get to know the owner because you went from a complete stranger on a letter to actual a human being. So now I'm actually Dr. Stephen Nguyen versus this random guy who sent a letter from California. So right. you need to become real. And then from there, like you said, you got to hit your list at least seven times, actually. So it's like asking someone to quit smoking. You have to ask them yeah. seven times yeah. at least. Direct mail is exactly the same way. You have to, if your list is, 3,000 and you do 300 letters a month, it's going to take you 10 months to hit your list. And then you want to repeat that list seven times. Because like I said, when you first sent the letter, they may not have been motivated at all. But the next two batches that came out, maybe they went through, there was a death in the family. There was a divorce that happened. There's a disagreement. There was disability. And now they're a motivated seller. 
So you said, you're buying situations. Yep. You're buying situations. And that I'm probably going to name the pot this episode that buying situations, not properties, because you're absolutely buying situations. Matter of fact, I'm writing that down because that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to steal that. <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, that's good stuff. So for, uh, thank you so much for coming out today. I really, as I told you guys, I knew I was going to get like, walk away with some good stuff on this. And this it motivates me to re-energize our, our uh, direct mail campaigns as we're coming into 2023. And I'm sure you can, you're pretty optimistic for what's coming up. Yeah. With all the financial uncertainty in the, in America, you did really well. Just the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up is you said you did really well during COVID. We did too. What do you think was the biggest thing? Because people that were so unsure of what was going on that it just made more people, people more inclined to sell or what, what do you, any, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm going off market. So I'm fishing from a different pond yes. compared to most investors. Right. Like, unfortunately, I never had a broker bring me a good deal. Right. I've never seen a good deal on LoopNet. Right. And actually, even now, my students are having more success of direct letters than me because of all the uncertainty. What does that mean? You can get opportunity for seller financing. People want seller market to sell at a seller market's price. But buyers, it's shifting towards a buyer's market. Right. So what is the solution? It's creative financing. Your price my terms. That's it. So I can give you your price. That's maybe overpriced for this market and this interest rate, but I'm willing to do it if you give me terms and do some creative financing. So actually right now, I think it's even better. Like if I did my strategy this year or this upcoming year, versus 2021, I'd probably have a way higher response rate. Oh, absolutely. So for me, I'm actually, you thrive in times of fear and because people, it's human nature. You they don't want to see the value of their asset crash right. when they want to retire. So they're willing to kind of play a ball a little more versus before. A lot of times I'd get written off saying I have 10, 20 other investors, despite going off market, it's okay. They'll move on for me. Right. Right. But now they're more likely to talk to you and engage, especially if they like, know, and trust you. Right. So to me, I've seen a lot of my students go in hot markets, like ones in San Antonio, and he got an 11 unit um, apartment complex in downtown San Antonio and is owned by this owner for four generations. So what does that mean? It's completely paid off. The, the fourth generation wants nothing to do with management. So what can you pitch right there? That's tax efficient, exactly. you know, seller carry first, seller financing, and you give her her price, make it known that's easy. She becomes the bank. You went from the landlord to upgrading to the bank, right? right? And you've moved up the totem pole essentially. Exactly. So that's how you kind of get them to understand it, make them feel good. And they're more likely to say yes to that. So to me, I feel like, you know, when I did it and me, me and you did it, it was a harder time, but if we can succeed during that time, it, you can succeed during any time. Oh, so 100%. for me, whether it's a good market, okay market, buyer's market, seller's market, I don't care. My strategy works in any market, and you just have to slightly tweak your approach depending on the market. And like I said, I, I wish I could buy more real estate during this time. I'm, I'm stabilizing my assets right now, but once they're done and I cash out refi, I have a lot more capital and then I'm going to dive right back in to my, my same system that I've been doing. Absolutely. The key here. Thank you, Steven. I appreciate you taking the time to come out today and, and share some, that's so much value with us. My goodness. I, I got, I got a legal pad full <laughs> and um, guys, this to summarize this whole this everything that we've talked about and there's a lot of solid gold in here this also begins and ends with consistency you coming because this is really not what we're doing is not rocket science it's that we're consistent you know i've been in real estate a very long time i've seen a lot of people come and i've seen a lot of people go I, most people go and the difference between the people that get to make it and the people that don't is consistency you know you come out into this you decide you want to do it you're going to need to get your marketing on task you know once you get your marketing on task even before you send out the first letter, you need to know what to say when somebody picks up the phone. Don't go send out 300 letters a month for 12 months and then don't answer the phone because that won't work. You got to put together systems and processes to handle business as it comes in. That begins by getting an organized way to take in that communication, take in that information. Leveled learning, as Stephen has shown us, is one something that is done in, in uh, college, in the, in the uh, pharmacy world, and in college in general, you know, laying airline pilots you're taught 
first of all, when you get your private pilot's license, you fly with a, a pilot that's probably been recently licensed because they need to get hours to advance their license. They now train you how not to, how to get off the ground and how to get back on the ground in one piece. You want to get into jets? Well, you have to do that in, in areas. Mike, for example, flies the Airbus 320, I think. He, that doesn't mean that he can walk into a, a 787, uh, a Boeing 787, and, and f- he, could he fly it? Probably. But is he, does he, is he allowed to fly it out of the gate? Not unless that sucker's going down and the other two pilots are dead because he's not certified on that yet. But if he wants to get certified on that, then he simply sits with those pilots, gets in the simulator, There's learns how to fly entries. it, and then gets licensed for it. So, guys, that's the thing. you got to get out here. you got to be consistent. Get over to the show notes on this. I will put his uh, link tree link in here. You can consume all the information, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. You can be sign up for an affiliate through him under prop stream. And of course, yellow letters complete. Um, the time to get it going and to get started is now. Don't wait till the end. And you're going to capitalize and you will crush it in 2023 if you take action and get started right now. This concludes today's episode. You don't have to wait till the next episode to learn to earn. Head over to CashflowGuys.com and contact Tyler and his team for more powerful tips and ideas so you can start generating multiple streams of income and escape the rat race.